scripture reading this morning will be Titus 2, uh, verses 11 through 14. Titus 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar, peculiar people, zealous of good works. Good morning, everyone. If you'd like to go ahead and mark your hymnal, if you haven't done so, for Brother Craig's song of invitation, we will get to that in just a moment. Um, I'd like to second Ben's prayer. Uh, we have a great crowd this morning. It's always nice to have friendly faces out there um, as the preacher comes up here to preach, because you know it's uh, something that we take seriously. We want to be able to preach God's word according to spirit and truth, um, and to be able to have folks here, that's always a benefit. Um, but I do appreciate his prayer also that uh, everything will go smoothly this morning as uh, I bring forth uh, another message of God's word. Alan did a good job with our scripture reading this morning. We'll actually uh, come back to that close to the, well, actually the very end of the lesson. I titled this Renew Your Mind. Um, as you may know, and if you don't know, you can turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. But that is one of the instructions that the early Christians were told to do, is that we need to renew our mind. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is. And then he gives three words to classify that. That which is good, and acceptable, and perfect. And one of the things that I want to look at today is, for many years, and, you know, until just recently, actually, I just kind of put those all together as synonyms, you know, basically meaning the same thing. That's what God is all about, is good, acceptable, perfect, and never really delved into that these are three very different things. Um, it wasn't until um, I was preparing for the um, high school class um, about a month ago that I really started looking at that scripture, and then I went into the original Greek um, translations and i can see that all three of those words are I'm now i'm not even going to try to pronounce those words if you know greek have at it i don't we're just going to put them up there as to what the greek translation was but they are very different words and they all three have very different meanings so i really want to uh, break those apart and then we'll come back to the scripture reading here in just a moment but there are three things that we are told to do um, in this letter to the roman church from paul you know, we got to renew our mind, but they, these are the three things we're going to focus on. The good, the acceptable, and the perfect. And when we look at what good was translated from in Greek, and we look up what it's meaning, it means good or virtuous or beneficial. When I go to the verse right above it, in verse 21 then, he says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So, as Brother Jim has said many times, we want to be able to use the Scripture to define the Scripture so that we can have the context in which it's being used, and I think that's very important. Right? So, if I know that we're talking about what the good is, then we can see here that we're going to overcome evil with good, then we get the idea that they are opposites of one another. Right? And English people, they're antonyms of one another. Right? So, we want to overcome the world, the, the evil things, what we would refer to as sin, and what God says is sin, with doing what is good in the eyes of God. When we go back to Psalms 37.3 in the Old Testament, the psalmist writes, he says, Trust in the Lord and do good. But how do we do that? Well, right after that, he kind of explains it. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. So the instruction was, you've got to put your trust in God, the Almighty, the Jehovah, and you have to do good. And he basically says, well, the way you're going to do that is you're going to dwell in this world. You're going to be in the land, 
and you're going to build, you're going to cultivate, you're going to grow faithfulness, right? So if we're causing problems with our family or our friends or our neighbors, we're not cultivating faithfulness. We're not doing as God has says for thousands of years. But when I look at what Jesus is saying in Luke 10, starting in verse 30, they're starting to once again question Jesus as to what good is, right? They're like, well, what, what are, you know, what's the best commandment? And in the previous scriptures, the guy says, well, to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, you have said right. He's like, yeah, but who's my neighbor? So in this scenario, in this um, parable, Jesus said, a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. We know this parable well. Right, by the, And by chance, a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite. Right? Jesus is picking very specific individuals for a reason. Right? When he came to that place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. People who are in charge of taking care of the people, Jesus is saying, yeah, they, they didn't. They ignored him. They let him suffer. And then the people that they despise the most, the Samaritans, he says, but a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion. He came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Right? I would hope that all of us, if we saw somebody laying on the side of the road, beat up, stripped of everything that they had, that we would have the same reaction. But Jesus is trying to get them to understand the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the Levites, the priests, they're not doing it. They're letting people struggle. They're letting people be hurt. What do we call that individual? What do we call the Samaritan? We call him the Good Samaritan. And we have the Good Samaritan laws. Why? Because he desired to do good. He desired to show God's love. And so when we're looking at that original scripture then in Romans, it's talking about what kind of actions are you and I doing to show God, right? If all I do is say that I believe in God, that I love Jesus, that he has cleansed me of my sins, I've been baptized for him, and I want to go to heaven, but there isn't anything that I'm doing in my life to be recognized as good in the eyes of God and in this world, Am I doing as God has asked? I'm not. When I renew my mind, I have to realize that my actions are going to speak louder than my words. And we've heard that. Right? We've heard that all of our lives. Your actions will always speak louder than your words. You can come here and you can pray and you can give your offering and you can partake of communion. You can read God's word. But if you're not living right, if you're not doing good to others, if you're mistreating them, you are failing God because God said you need to do good. You need to show God in your actions, in your kindness. There should be love in what you're doing. In 1 Corinthians 13, we know it well. And oftentimes it's read at weddings, but that's not what the scripture was written for. He wrote that for Christians. Love is kind. Love is patient. Love is not jealous. He's talking to the church it's like, this is how we are to show love to one another as Christians. And if we're not showing that, we're not doing the good. And we're not fulfilling what God has asked. Because if we're not showing his mercy and his forgiveness and his love, then we have to remember that Jesus says, if you're not willing to show those things to your fellow man, why in the world would you expect my father to show it to you? And when you realize how we treat people at times, that God might treat us the exact same way, we need to renew our minds. We've got things to fix. The second word that was in the Roman letter is acceptable. 
And when we look at the Greek translation, it says it is well agreeable with or to be in good. And I, I don't like big words. Synchronicity or I think that I don't know. I might have said it right. I don't know. Might have botched it. But in Romans 14 verses 18 and 19. In Paul's letter, he says, for he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. How? How is he acceptable by God and approved by men? It says, so when we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. When we are seeking peace and building up one another. That's what's acceptable by God. Right? Now, as we've talked in the high school class, there are times that we get frustrated in this world and we want to be a part of this world and we would rather have vengeance. Right? We would rather be angry. We would rather be greedy. We would rather fight because that's the emotions that we have. But God's word says, no, nah, that's not it, my friends. If you're going to be acceptable when Christ comes back to claim his church, you're to be seeking peace and building each other up, not tearing each other down. I have family members that they just simply can't get along. Brothers and sisters who are at each other when we get together as a family. And I'm like, why? You know, so... On that side of the family, my father's side of the family, we just don't go there anymore because I don't want to be a part of that. That's not peace for me. Right? And that's not a good example for my kids. Right? If we're not seeking the peace, if we're not seeking to build each other up, no matter what we feel we deserve, does not matter. Because when we look at what Jesus did for us to give us this opportunity to serve him and his father... He didn't deserve what he went through either. Letting it go. It's a difficult human trait because we don't want to. But I have to pursue peace. I have to pursue building each other up because that's what's acceptable to God. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9 and 10, it uses the exact same Greek word, for to be pleasing. He says, therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. The exact same word in the original Greek translation. Right? So when they put it into English, they're trying to make it clear to us. Right? That is our ambition. That is our goal. That is our daily choice. If we're with people or not, if we're here worshiping or if we're at home, if we're in our cars, if we're by ourselves, we are to be pleasing to God. Why? Because he says in verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed by his deeds in the body according to that which he has done, whether good or bad. I know that there have been times in my life that the idea of forgiving people that hurt me when I was a kid, I was not willing to do. I was convinced in my head I couldn't do it. You know, I remember at times I would be praying and it'd be on my heart to say, okay, I, I need to forgive them. But then I would say, but God, you don't know what they did to me. It's illogical. Yeah, he does. We want to hold on to that because Satan drives us with that. But if I realize that in the end, I'm going to have to give account for that. I want my vengeance. I want my retribution. I want what I feel like I deserve. God's going to say, all right, in the end, this is what you deserve. Depart from me, those who work iniquity. You're on the left-hand side, you're with the goats, and your judgment is eternal damnation, and that's not what we desire, because we desire the good, right? 
We all have to give account. That's what the scriptures have said multiple times. We all have to give account. We have to stand before God. We have to stand in front of Jesus and say, okay, I believed in you. You were my savior and your blood washed me of my sins, but yet I didn't want to give it up. Or thank you for allowing me this opportunity to give it up. You forgave me and I forgave them. And I moved on to seek out that peace. When we go into Hebrews 13, and we go down to verse 20, it says, Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, when Jesus our Lord equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing. It is the same Greek word in the original transcripts. Pleasing in his sight, not our sight, not what we want, in his sight. And then he says, I'll make that clear, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. What's going to be pleasing? Every good work. Our actions, our choices. Right? Jesus has to give his stamp of approval when he opens your book of life. And he welcomes his kingdom into heaven. Will he give it? I don't know. Only you know. You're accountable for yourself. In Mark 12, we can see where Jesus is sitting in the synagogue and the offerings being brought forth. It says, and he sat down opposite the treasury, referring to Jesus here. And he began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury. And how many rich people were putting in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which amount to a cent. Calling his disciples to him, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury. For they all put in out of their surplus. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she owed, owned, excuse me, all that she had to live on. Now, notice he does not condemn the wealthy people. There's nothing wrong with what they did. All of their gifts are acceptable, right? But her heart was greater than anyone else's. He knows what she sacrificed. She was willing to give everything that she had to support the church, to support the kingdom. It was well agreeable in the eyes of Jesus Christ. And we have to choose if we're going to be the same or not. In Hebrews 11.4, we go back to the you know, chapter of faith. Right? We look at Cain and Abel. Right? Abel, unfortunately, made a sacrifice that ended up costing him his physical life. It says, by faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. How do we know that? Because as it continues on, God testifying about his gifts. Abel continues to be praised for what he did, even though he had such a short life. And Cain was cursed. He says, through faith, th though he is dead, he still speaks. When our life is gone on this earth, we have to be accepted by God to obtain heaven. And there are often times that we find ourselves as human beings who fall short of the glory of God, doing things in secret we don't think other people know about. But we need to be aware that God will open that book and we're going to give account for everything, good or bad. There is nothing in secret. And when we go into the idea of I deserve this and I want my revenge and, and I want my pound of flesh, as the saying is, God's simply going to say, why? I gave you everything. Just as this widow gave everything. I gave you everything. I gave you my only begotten son. And he died for you. What more did you really need on this earth? When we look at the Revelation letter and the idea of what's going to be acceptable and what's not, John 
tells us in chapter 22, verse 12, he says, Behold, I am coming quickly, Jesus speaking to him. He says, And my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those. These are the ones that are acceptable in his eyes. Who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter my gates into the city. Those are the ones that will be acceptable by Jesus. And Jesus says, this is my right. This is my reward. I will be able to come down and reap my kingdom. Blessed are those if you wash your robes and you do what is right in his eyes. When it comes to the good, that's our actions. And when it comes to the acceptable, that's Jesus and God making a judgment of it. Right? That's what the translation is trying to tell us. Are our actions going to be approved? Is Jesus going to be able to put a stamp of approval on you? Are you doing as God has asked you to? I'm going to try that word again. It's, it's there for you. Because if we say no, we're not accepted. And that really is our choice. We can be as angry, upset, mad, frustrated, want, 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 all we want. But when it comes to the end, God's going to say, I gave you my son. He hung on that cross and suffered the most humiliating, agonizing death for you. You needed nothing else. That's all you needed. We have to get past the rest. What about the word perfect? And we, we in the high school class, we talked about, you know, this word perfect. Because I know for many years I struggled. I'm like, well, I, I can never obtain that. 100% accurate. Never can. Right. So the Greek translation, it just simply means to be fully complete. And that is used in many different ways in God's word. When we look at Matthew five, Jesus speaking here, he said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Right. So he's talking about the time where the children of Israel were to have nothing to do with the rest of the world. They need to keep themselves separate and apart from, right? But Jesus is like, okay, we're, we're beyond that now, right? The fulfillment of the Messiah, I'm here. And I'm telling you, you, you can't love just your friends, your family, your church members, and hate everyone else. He says, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And if you're like me, many years ago, you sat there, but you don't understand what I've been through. Think about Jesus hanging on that cross and the last request that he made to his father. All of these people filled with hate and anger and spite wanted him to die called for his blood to be cursed upon them, their children, and their children's children. And he still prayed, God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He prayed for his enemies. That's hard for us. It says, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Well, how can we possibly be like God? Well, look at how he describes or what God does before he says God is perfect. He says, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. What he's saying is everyone in this world, if you are a Christian or non-Christian, if you're a believer or not a believer, if you are, you know, 
a faithful individual or an atheist, you still get everything handed to you on this earth that God offered. You have to choose it. That's why he says, if all you do is you love your friends and family, what, what good are you compared to the atheists? They do the same thing. If you're only willing to help for those people that you care about and you're going to mistreat the people that you don't care about, what makes you any better than the Gentiles? Right? They only help each other. If you're going to be perfect, we're not going to be perfect. But if we are showing love and kindness and mercy as God expects us to do to everyone, aren't we seeking perfection? Sharing God's love and mercy? Because that's what he's talking about. In Matthew 19, it says, And someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? Once again, a very famous story that we're all aware of. He said to him, Why, why are you asking me about what is good? There, there's only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he, what we refer to as the rich young ruler, then he said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said, all these things I've kept, what am I still lacking? I'm a good person. What else do I need to do? Jesus said, well, if you wish to be complete, Right? Same word in the Greek translation as perfect. Go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. God knew or Jesus knew that he was still lacking something. He had a greedy heart. He wanted and wanted and wanted and he wasn't willing to give that up jesus says you want to be perfect you want to be complete you want to be accepted into heaven put god first and not your pocketbook in first corinthians 13 we go to those scriptures that i mentioned a moment ago about love he says love never fails but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. Right? They're speaking, they're saying that, you know, we can do part of these things that Jesus blessed us to be able to do. But with Jesus, when he returns, our importance is nothing. They were important. They were the apostles. And their job was to continue preaching and spreading the gospel and baptizing for the remission of sins in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They could perform miracles. They were important individuals. But when the perfect comes, when Jesus returns to claim his kingdom, their importance goes from here to nothing. They're done. And they knew that. We at times feel like we deserve because we are more important than others. That's not what God says. Right? But it's also the idea that when Jesus returns as the perfect one and he claims us and we are changed to be like him, we then become perfect. When we look at Philippians 3.12, it says, not that I've already obtained it. Right? Paul realizes, yeah, you know, I, I, I've, I've made a lot of changes. I've really improved myself. I'm striving on a daily basis to be good, but I'm still not there. He knows he can't be there, right? Not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may, may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. He was chosen by Christ Jesus to be the apostles of the Gentiles. Was he worthy? No. But are any of us worthy of the blood of Christ? No. 
Christ shows love and mercy to each and every one of us. When we get to the end, we can become complete. We can become perfect, but only through Jesus, only through his blood, only through the forgiveness of our sins. Well, I've already walked down this path and, I, you know, I can't change directions now. Yeah, you can. Why can't you? Right? Think about where Paul was headed when he was Saul. He was on the road to Damascus to do what? He was going to persecute Christians. He, by law, had in his hand the authority to do so. Put him in prison, stone him to death, whatever he wanted to do, because Jesus could not be the Messiah. And when Jesus spoke to him, he was like, yeah, what are you doing here? This is wrong. He changed his path instantly. Right? It wasn't some, well, I have to go and finish this job over here before I follow Jesus. Nope, that wasn't it. He's like, all right, I'm on the wrong road. Time to jump off of it and get on the right one. In James's letter in chapter 1, verse 25, he says, but one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, Right? The gospel, the one that frees us from sacrifices and all of the other commandments of old that we had to fulfill. He says, if we abide in it, not having become forgetful hearers, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. There's so much in that one scripture. Right? If I'm abiding so I've been baptized for the forgiveness of my sins, and I'm striving to study and apply and do, right? And I'm not going to forget, right? Because uh, as I told the high school kids, there were times in my life after I got baptized at the age of 16, I just forgot. How was I supposed to be living my life, right? And I put me first. So I have to abide in it, right? I can't forget what I heard, why I was baptized, and why I know that God loves me and is willing to forgive me. But notice it says that you're an effectual doer. It may go against your grain, that you have to be kind to your neighbor because they really annoy you. Too bad. God says be kind. That's it. Be kind. All right. Because that's how we're blessed. So how do I know the way I need to live and what I need to do? We've got the perfect law, the complete law. From the Old Testament when God created the world all the way to the end. Where Jesus is sent up into heaven and he's going to come back and he's going to claim his kingdom. We know it all, exactly what God wants us to do. It's there. I don't need anything else. The perfect is there. We have the perfect Savior. We have God's perfect word that can lead us to be a perfect soul for all eternity. But I have to be willing to renew my mind. I have to get past me and what I feel like I deserve and what I want to do and focus in on what God says. We have to be able to show the world what is good and what is acceptable, and what is perfect. So if you will turn with me back to the scripture reading for this morning, and then the lesson will be yours. Applying the same idea. It says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desire, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Be the good. Do the good. Is what he's saying. If you want to know what the good is, you look at God's law. Right? He says, we're looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus, or Christ Jesus, who gave himself to us to redeem us if we are redeemed by jesus we are found acceptable we are well pleasing 
to Jesus. Because in the end, he's going to judge you for everything you have done on this earth, good or bad. We hope that the good is what he sees. From error, every lawless deed and to purify, I'm going to repeat that, to redeem us from every lawless deed, to purify for himself a people for his own possession. You're purified. You're made perfect. If you are forgiven of your sins and you have been baptized, those sins are washed away. As I talked with the high school class this morning, you know, there's still going to be times when you're a Christian and you're going to make those big mistakes. Right? You're not just going to kind of trip and stumble and catch your step. You're going to trip, fall on your face, get all scuffed up, road rash, it's going to hurt. There's going to be major problems. But you can get back up. Because if you've been baptized, you can say, God, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I messed up. I failed you. Please forgive me. And as we talked this morning in the high school class, we don't forget it. Right? I've had conversations with many of our brothers and sisters here with things that we've messed up on. We don't forget it. It's still back here. Right? But God says it's all good. You ask for forgiveness, you've been washed in his blood, and I, I erased it. It doesn't exist. There's not even those indentations from a pencil left over after you erased it. It's all gone. And we can continue on. But we have to be zealous for good deeds. We are going to be judged by how we live. We're given the handbook. We have one thing that we need, and that is the blood of Christ to wash us clean of our sins. Beyond that, everything else is contained in this book. You want to know how to be kind to people? Read his book. You want to know how to serve God righteously? Read his book. You want to know how to get beyond the pain, the suffering, the agony, and the pain and anger? And show love, read his book. Because when it comes down to it, just as the individual answered Jesus and said, well, you need to put God first. Love him with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then you love your neighbors as yourself. Jesus is like, you answered right. That's how you're the good. That's what Jesus wants from us. Did he want to die for us? No. But he wanted us to go to hell even less than he wanted to die. So he was willing to die for us in agony. Because he knew blood had to be offered from a perfect sacrifice. And he was the only thing that would work. And his father said, I need you to do this. So that my children, my kingdom can be claimed and spend all eternity with me. And Jesus said, okay. And if you believe that, as Brother Hines said last week... And you believe that God is your creator and your father, that his son came down and now reigns in heaven because he conquered death, then why aren't you being baptized if you haven't been? And if you have been, but you aren't living right, why? You are not more important than God. You have no rights that need to be addressed other than the right to serve our Heavenly Father in the way that He desires you to do so. If you haven't been baptized, we will offer that opportunity to you. Or if you have sinned in a way or need the support from the congregation and prayers, we will offer that to you as well as we stand and sing our invitation hymn.